Like moths to a flame, you've thrown caution to the wind for a glimpse into our world. Well, now you're in it. Welcome to Aft Up Stories. Everybody and welcome to another episode of Effed Up Stories. I am your host, Will Pender. And I am your co-host, Ryan Sharp. And tonight we will be covering the last user-submitted story on near-death experiences. Uh, this is for our near-death experience week. Um, we do have uh, another two podcasts on the topic coming. They're just not user-submitted. Um, it focuses more on different facts to do with near-death experiences, uh, elements of that, and also some really effed up stories that uh, we found and thought would be interesting to discuss. So um, before we jump into that, uh, oh, actually, just a little snippet of what this is. This may be, let me just say this right now, this may be the most effed up story that we've ever covered or possibly will cover because this is on the absolute edge of what I think we can put out there. It's it's very it's almost abstract. It's so effed up. It's, it's a trip. It's, it's definitely um, one of the more surreal uh, experiences I've had in terms of uh, uh, literature. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a trip. For, so for any of you out there that uh, smoke a toke or have a couple drinks, this show should be interesting for you. Um, <laughs> be- before we jump into that, though, um, if you have an effed up story of your own on the paranormal, we'd like to get it. And you can submit that to us at the official website, which is effedupstories.com. That's E-F-F-E-D-U-P-S-T-O-R-I-E-S.com. Uh, go to the menu, click on submissions, fill out the form, hit submit. We'll get it, put it on the website, and get it into a podcast. So uh, send us all your stuff. We'd love to put it out there. And um, with that said, uh, we're going to continue on with our near-death experience week. This story, by the way, was sent in by a gentleman named Gary Lalande, and uh, he's a tattoo artist. Um, Very... It's a very interesting story, but I'm going to uh, preface it by just saying this. I know it's going to be out there, and depending on your take on this kind of stuff, it's, it, I mean, it's out there. But here's the thing. Uh, when you have a near-death experience, uh, suppose you know our brain is releases this chemical called DMT, and DMT is known to be the most profound hallucinogenic Uh, chemical that we know of so really this shouldn't be all that out there if you think about it and you really look at it in that light so with that said we're going to jump into Gary's story so it begins when he was at his fiance's house and fictitious name but we're going to refer to her as Samantha and Gary kept hearing on this particular day, he kept hearing this faint classical music. And he asked Samantha where this music was coming from, but she couldn't hear it. And later that evening, he began to feel sick. So he ended up calling a cab to bring him home because he needed to rest. And 
it turned out to be uh, the reason he was feeling sick was he had this really bad flu and he had it for he ended up having it for three days. And during this whole time, he continued to hear that classical music. And for him, he said it was nice, you know, it was soothing. And it didn't really bother him that he didn't know where it was coming from because for him, it was just this soothing music that he would hear. So his three days of sickness, as he put it, consisted of vomiting and fever. And, you know, to combat that, he kept himself well hydrated. Um, and during this whole period, he would send regular updates to his fiance um, via text messages. And after the third day, he started to come around somewhat and he could finally eat. And he said, you know, the flu had, had kind of changed to feel more like a cold at this point. But that evening is where things begin to get very effed up. So that evening, uh, he phones Samantha. He tells her how much he missed her and that he'd see her tomorrow. And he flicked on a YouTube video like many of us do, um, just as a background thing. And he began to talk with a friend on Facebook. And during this talk, he was starting to get tired. And when he finally let his eyes close, he said he was instantly transported to a forest at night. And it was as if he didn't have any eyelids. So opening, he, there's no opening and closing your eyes. They're just open. There's no eyelids. And this is something that you'll also hear from many different near-death experiences. You can't close your eyes. You're just there. So when he initially found this to be the case, it gave him some panic. Um, and especially because while this was happening, he was still aware that he was also still at his computer chatting with his friend Mikey on Facebook. This was all simultaneously happening. And because he was experiencing the strange sensation of not having eyelids, and he was awake, he was oddly concerned that, you know, that he's never going to be able to sleep again, because how do you go to sleep without eyelids? Um, so he started to explain to his friend what was actually happening. And he jokingly replied, and this is in quotes, Dude, you're ascending. Just relax, calm down, go with it. So that's what he did. So now he's just focused in the forest, okay? And he said everything, and this is strange to picture, but he's in the forest, and he said everything was slowly moving counterclockwise. All of, you know, the forest, the trees, the plants, everything is just moving slowly counterclockwise. And he later came to find out that in the spirit world, energy moves counterclockwise. Um, whereas in the here and now, energy flows clockwise. And he said everything was moving, the ground, the trees, the stars. But he was not asleep, nor was he dreaming. He's very, uh, you know, he, he says he's awake. He's very much emphasizing that he's awake. And he said the, the whole, uh, you know, the motion of this place was making him dizzy. And because of this, he found this large rock and he lid down on it. And after a while of lying on this rock, animals began to pass by. And they would stop and stare at him before they would continue on their way. And then he said people began to pass him. And he said once the people got near them, they would point at him as if they were wondering how he got there. Maybe he was out of place. And almost as if it was strange to them that he should even be there. He felt foreign. And next thing he knew, people began to walk right up to him. And he described these people as almost being like zombies. He said they would come up and their skin was rotting off and pus was oozing out of their faces. He said they were literally like the living dead, very much like zombies. But this wasn't a dream. This wasn't some trip. He, was, he emphasizes this was happening. It was real. And he said, these were real dead people. And he was confused. Where is he? How is this happening? And he said, then others approached him 
with their faces covered in cloth. And he could feel them judging him. And he said, some came alone, others came in groups. But they would come to him and he could feel them judge him. And after which, he would judge himself. And then they would move on for the next one in line to come up and the process would repeat. And he began to feel that, you know, to get the feeling that these people were his dead relatives and or possibly his ancestors. And this, you know, line and movement of judging and self-judgment continued for a while until there was just one lone body left. And this figure stood with his back to him about 10 feet away. And he said he was cloaked in a dark red hood. And after five or 10 minutes had passed, he began to get really scared. You know, why wasn't this guy coming to judge him like all the others? And at this moment, all the others that had done their judging were standing around him at a distance, watching him. And suddenly, this hooded figure slowly turned to him and revealed itself. He said it was like a cross between a human and a snake. Greenish in color, red eyes with black pupils, and he said he looked pissed. He slowly came towards him, and he repeatedly told himself to not be afraid over and over. And as this figure drew nearer, he began to smell him. And once he got close enough, he got the craziest sense of deja vu. He knew him. He didn't know how, but he knew who this was. They had met before. And more than that, they've done this. Whatever they're in the middle of now, they've done this before. And Gary felt fear. This is Herberus. This, this is who he says this figure is. It's Herberus. And if you don't know who Herberus is, it's, um, it's essentially an ancient symbol of a snake that's eating its own tail. Um, it often symbolizes the notion of something constantly recreating itself or, um, you know, the eternal return. But anyway, that's who he said this figure was. It was Herberus. And he knew what needed to happen, and that was he needed to let Herberus swallow him. And I, I'm telling you, this is going to get effed up. <laughs> okay. So anyway, the closer Herberus came toward him, the angrier Herberus became. And once he was face to face with him, he was you know he was so angry. He said that the the face or the Herberus's eye was twitching. He was shaking, and he thought you know he's going to tear me apart. And he drew back from fear, and that's when he heard one of his ancestors say that he would have to try this again. And Herberus went back to where he was. And the whole process began again. Only this time, Herberus is bigger. And this is going to be harder to do this time. On the second attempt, he was huge and had eyes covering his whole body. He said it was disgusting. But this is what he had to do. He had to let Herberus take him, swallow him. That was, he had to do that and not draw back from fear. He had... He knew that that was what he had to do. So he let Erber swallow him. And he said he let Erber swallow him feet first. And he went deep inside the serpent. He said inside, its insides were pressed up against him as he slowly moved inwards. And he remembers seeing its veins and the blood flowing through them. The inside began to widen. And he said his ancestors were on the other side of him. In the serpent guiding him, they said, You know how to do this. You've done it before. And in his head, he was thinking, You know, what if, when the fuck have I done this? When have I been swallowed by a snake? But at the same time, he had an inner knowing of what he was supposed to do. You know, it, it, there was a sense of deja vu there. Like, there was a sense that he had done this before. And he somehow knew that this whole experience was just challenges and lessons. And he said his ancestors were testing him as he moved through the serpent. 
He was supposed to somehow see everything, but see it without looking at anything. Projections of people and organic feather things would shoot into his line of vision, but he was meant to ignore them. And if he looked at it, the serpent would spit him out, he would fail the challenge, and it would it would just start over. So he was forced to face what he calls his shadow self. And that is, you know, things that he's done wrong to people in life. Uh, things that he had to ask himself for forgiveness for. Um, you know, a couple of times he had heard his ancestors speaking around him and he could hear them say, he's not going to make it. It's going to spit him out. And, you know, this challenge, uh, you know, this lasted for hours. He was just going through this thing, going through these um different checkpoints I guess you could call it he said he could see sacred geometry in there and there was something important about the infinity symbol and as his experience pressed on he became very thirsty he said his mouth was dry as cotton one of the people came to him holding a glass of water and said you want to drink come on you're almost done and it was it was as if he was trying to help him push through this experience and as he got closer to the end of his journey, the snake's insides turned to stone. And he said it was like a cave. It became all jagged rock. And next, people that he knew in his current life, people that were still alive were standing at his size, but they were transparent like ghosts. And he said his dead ancestors started to get excited and happy, proud that he had almost finished his journey of passing through the serpent. And he could hear them saying, happy days ahead. And then he began to hear drumming. And he was right at the end. He could feel his feet coming out of the serpent's tail. And at the same time, some sort of portal in his bedroom wall and into his bed. And he knew this because as he did, he felt his elbow hit the edge of the portal in his wall and his wall as he was coming through. And he... He was excited. He was so relieved to have been through uh, this experience and to have made it through the serpent. And as he got into his bed, you know, he rubbed his eyes. And then he said he experienced something truly bizarre. And this is just going to get more effed up. Just letting you guys know. As he pressed his hands against his eyes, he could see through the walls. Now, just to, to clarify this a bit. It's when he pushed his hands against his eyes, it's like looking into his hands gave him this vision. Um, he said it wasn't quite like x-ray vision, but it was like looking through a two-way mirror. He could see the other side, and he could see and hear dead people. So this was, you know, it, looking through his hands, he could look into the world of the dead. And he said the spirit world is all around us, in every room, every nook, every cranny. And he got, you know, he was exhausted from the experience. So, uh, you know, he got a few hours sleep and then he got up. He went to work. Um, and when he got there, he could hear that classical music again. And when he heard it, he put his hands over his eyes. So he's back now. He, there's no dream. There's no, uh, you know, this is not some strange ex experience anymore that, you know, he, he's awake. He's at work. And he's having this this strange ability. He's still able to do it. And he said, uh, you know, when he heard this classical music, he put his hands up over his eyes, and again, he could see the other side. And he said, in this room, he was able to look into the other side of the room. It's like a mirror, I guess a mirror image. And he said, you know, a mirror image of the room that he's in. And in that room... He could see a piano, and he could also see music stands, chairs, and a girl with brown hair playing the violin, along with a blonde-headed woman staring at him while seated on one of the chairs. And she noticed that he was watching those, all of them, and she started to sing to him. He said she came right up to the wall, and the sound of her, her voice and music was amazing. So this is the classical music that he was hearing, was this group of people from the spirit realm just on the, the other side of the realm that he's in. 
and he could finally see it with this newfound ability to look into the spirit realm through his hands. And, uh, you know, he said he never heard music so beautiful as this before. And after she finished, an older-looking native man with long hair and a goatee sat beside her. She called him Da, which he knew instinctively to be short for dead. And she told him that Gary could see them. And he brushed it off to her and claimed that that's not possible. But she said, yeah, he can, you know. He's doing the hand thing over his eyes right now. Uh, he can see us, right? I, don't, I know that's strange, but anyway. Um, what he, the native gentleman said to her next, Gary was unsure of, but he got the impression that uh, he told her not to talk to him or get close as to interfere with his, you know, him living his normal life. And I've heard that before, too, with, um, you know, other beings in other realms are not meant to interfere with us in our life here on earth but anyway you know Gary found it really bizarre that uh, everyone on the other side seemed to be young as if they were all in their early 20s all except the older native man and Gary spent the rest of the day at work um, drying and trying to process everything that had happened to him that day and the night before and was still happening and when he left he went to his fiance's and you know, began to tell her the whole story. And the first thing she said to him is, you know, why you? And he didn't know. You know, why him? And this is the evening. He's he's beginning to get tired again. So he went home and he went to sleep and the lesson started. So he goes to sleep and he said, this time, um, you know, again, he was in another experience and In this experience, he would learn how to manipulate energy in reality to instantly manifest anything. He said this was knowledge that he would need for coming challenges or tests, that he might have to overcome fear, fear of death or pain. So as he lay there in his bed looking around his room, he could hear drumming coming from the other side, you know, the the spirit realm. And... He said there was a young man who stayed with him on the other side of the wall. And this is the spirit realm. Remember, it's just like for him, it's like looking into a two-way mirror. And he said, you know, this young man was on the other side of the wall at the head of his bed. And he said he just laid there watching over him while he was at the same time tossing a baseball around. And Gary found it neat that, you know, he could actually feel the breeze coming from this other room, like from his wall, but from the other room on the spiritual mirror side, coming into his room. And he said, uh, you know, the other side side seemed a lot like here, except he said everyone looked like they were in their prime age, you know, like their early 20s. And that's something, by the way, just a little side note, uh, a lot of people mention in near-death experiences when they see dead relatives or people they knew, they always say that they, they look... Like they were at that perfect age of, you know, they looked their best. They were in their prime. So that that's what Gary's seeing here. Everyone he notices over there looked like they're in their prime. And he said he could tell that it was summer over there. And there was some native things on the walls like dream catchers, medicine wheels, decorations with feathers and fur. And as he looked around the room, he could see this semi-dark energy type of substance that was over literally everything. And he said the substance was slowly moving counterclockwise, and this is something that he had mentioned in the forest earlier. And he thought to himself that he wishes he could stop moving so he could get a better look at this stuff. And as soon as he had that thought, it did. It did stop. And then he heard a female on the other side say, shit, you know, he can control this. And the guy that was in the room said, yes, he can, as if he was proud. And he said more of these people on the other side gathered around in this room to watch him. And he began to manipulate this dark energy into a ball of a substance that was dark, flaky, and constantly moving. And entirely he was moving this with his mind. And then he realized he could use this substance to create anything that he wanted. Next, 
An odd, dark-looking form came toward him and stopped inches from his face, and he felt its fur on his own face, and he said it smelled somewhat like a cat. And he heard a purr, and he said he saw what looked like a furry paw in his peripheral vision, and as he turned his head to look at it, it vanished. But then he remembered his lessons from inside the serpent. And if you remember, one of that was to see without looking. So Gary got excited, and he thought of a black panther. And then he heard a noise on the other side from his room. Something was coming toward him, and it slowly got up on the bed. And in his peripheral vision, he could see what looked like a mostly formed black panther. And as he focused on the details of it, it drew closer. He felt its breath, he smelt it, and it laid beside him purring. And then he heard the others on the other side say, look at that, he manifested a panther. And Gary couldn't help but smile. All of this was so amazing. And he said he spent the next few hours manifesting all kinds of different animals. Bears, wolves, crows, butterflies, snakes, spiders. And then he thought of pizza and sure enough, it manifested right in front of him. And then he manifested a glass of water. He could literally manifest anything. And then he remembered the sacred geometry that he saw inside the serpent and began to manifest the flower of life, making it spread out everywhere. And he heard the sounds of shock from his ancestors on the other side while he was doing this. And then he thought of having wings, and huge wings shot out of his back. He could hear the feathers ruffling, and he could see the shadow of these wings on the walls. And despite all of this, he knew he had to get some rest for the next work day. So he decided to go to sleep. And it was during the sleep that he had this dream that he realized that there was a negative entity watching over him. And he said it was an archon, also known as rulers. He said they are the greatest deceivers in the universe. They feed off negative human emotion. And he said this archon tricked him and came to him posing as that older native gentleman from before. He said he pretended to be that native man, looked like him, referred to himself as the shaman. He proceeded to show him the image of Herberus and told him, This is Herberus, this is our God. And Gary began to question him, Our God, aren't we all aspects of our creator? Why are you worshipping this serpent? And he said, it represents the never-ending cycle of reincarnation. And this bothered Gary. He believed it was just forcing reincarnation on people so that they can never spiritually evolve, and these archons could continue to feed off the negative emotions of humans as they are recycled over and over. And then Gary awoke from the dream, trying to understand why the older native man would say these things. And he wasn't aware at the time that it was an imposter. So Gary went to work once again, and he heard the classical music. And he put his hands over his eyes, he looked at the wall, and into the other side. And once again, he could see the blonde girl and the older native man. He could see that they were talking, but he couldn't really hear them. And as this was happening, a customer came into a shop. And, you know, he went to attend the, you know, as he went to attend the customer and asked him what tattoo he wanted, the blonde girl stopped talking and actually listened to what Gary was doing on his side of the world. And uh, later on that evening, he said when he went home, uh, you know, more tests and challenges were to start. He said his fiance Samantha was texting him and wondering why he wasn't talking to her much. And he tried to explain all this craziness that he was going through. But, you know, again, it's hard to articulate and it was hard to really put it in a way that uh, someone can digest. And he said when he went to, uh, you know, when he lid down to go to sleep, a strange device started to come up the side of the bed. And he said, this device looks similar to a remote control, but it had a poison dart shooter attached, almost like something that you would see in a spy movie. And he said he was scared. He 
jumped up, uh, thinking to himself, they are trying to kill me. And then once again, like deja vu, it hit him. You know, this is another test. And he focused on his breathing. He calmed himself down. And he said the strange object came around his bed again, and he thought and focused on the panther. And as he did so, it manifested and laid beside him as the one that he summoned before did. And he said this one stayed on, you know, he, uh, this one stayed on the other side of the wall, uh, the, the spirit side. And he said he was safe. Um, so he had two panthers there with him now, and they were both protecting him. And he said the young man on the other side, ex- you know, excitedly said to the older man, he did it. He manifested two panthers to protect himself. And the older native uh, was surprised that he could do this. So uh, <clears throat> that's the end of uh, Gary's story. And uh, like I said, it, it's it's a trip. Um, so Ryan, now what what's your thoughts? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's a, you know, that's going to be a tough one for people to digest, I think, first off, you know, um, it's a fantastically amazing story. And, you know, the first the first two times I read it, because I, I, I read it two times, once and over and once again, it, it you know, I, uh, I personally got a strange sense of, of deja vu when I, I realized that the story in its entirety reminded me of a lot of different um, ancient uh, of, of tales, I guess. Um, just in the way, I guess the way it was, you know, the serpent, uh, the way the story is, is structured with, um, you know, the, the the lessons and the uh, the obstacles. The, on all the tests, it just you know. I mean, I've 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 also been uh, always been very fascinated in the ancient cultures and um, the stories that they told about uh, their various journeys and and whatnot. And it you know, it, there's not any one story that I think it 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 reminded me exactly of as much as the overall tone. And you know, to me, it, it it certainly sounded, you know, if you you changed all these these names to ancient sounding names, you know, Gary Samantha uh, um, could easily be a tale be uh, coming, you know, to us from four thousand years ago. Um, I think there's some very classical um, themes in it. Obviously, the serpent is 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 one of them now. The serpent is literally in every religion and, and mythology that I've ever read. I, I, I don't think there's a single one that uh, where the serpent is excluded. Um, and especially, uh, you know, I, I, we've talked a lot this week about um, substances and, and ayahuasca. Being this, um, I believe, is Peruvian uh, a- people from the Peruvian Amazon, uh, Amazon, uh, you know, create this this uh, uh, substance called ayahuasca out of vines and leaves, and according to them, the spirit creature or the spirit of ayahuasca is this enormous serpent, and. You know, it's a it, it, it's a governing spirit for, um, you know, perhaps the experience or you know w- what they mean by the spirit of ayahuasca. I'm not 100 percent sure because ayahuasca, as far as I, I'm aware, is a you know a mixture of uh, uh, the name of a substance that is a mixture of two different plants. So, you know, it's it's kind of like this this governing spirit, and of course. You know, it put, puts you in mind of Quetzalcoatl, uh, the, the feathered serpent. Um, of course, the, the serpent from Genesis. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, all through Egyptian mythology, serpents, 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 um, to the point where they put them on the headdress. Uh, 
um, the the Kundalini, you know, being the the coiled up uh, band of energy, I guess, that resides at the the base of your 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 tailbone, your base chakra, um, and as you ascend, your your Kundalini rises up and you know activates each, each of your chakras eventually coming out of the crown chakra and resting upon the third eye which some say is is the uh, the point of the serpent in the pharaoh headdresses you see the serpent comes out through the top and it rests itself on the third eye and that's the you know the um, the symbol of godhead uh, reaching full ascendancy so there's so much you know, um, allegory and and imagery in in Gary's tale that you know it runs parallel with so many different forms of spiritualism all throughout human history. That you know, I I think it would be wrong to outright dismiss his story, as wild and outlandish as it sounds. It's you know, and and somebody might say, "Well, why him? Why some random tattoo artist?" Well, why guy? not? And exactly, why not? Why why did the White Wright brothers figure out flight, uh, a dream of mankind's for thousands and thousands of years, and they figured it out? You know, why them? What was special about them? You know, and the truth is, is that there's nothing any more or any less special with with anybody, um, and you know, at, at any time, at any moment, I think that, you know, these kinds of trials, th the whole idea of ascension and um, moving your consciousness upwards, uh, reaching a higher vibrational state, I think that's for, for you know, if, if such a thing exists, and I do believe it does, um, I think it's, it's a holy... Uh, not holy as in holy, but a holy um, um, personal experience that each person will experience such a thing in their own way, kind of like a you know uh, um, and any other near death experience is is concerned. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, one thing I'd like to point out with uh, you know again to. I guess speak on behalf of, uh, you know, giving this a a serious look and not just dismissing it, is that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's you that told me or I read it somewhere, but, uh, you know, it's believed that when we go to sleep, um, our brain actually releases very tiny amounts of DMT. Yeah, when, when we, we were, I believe we were speaking about this the other day, um, that there's some... There are some who believe uh, that, um, uh, and I and I believe it's also it's actually uh, from the pineal gland, which has also been referred to as the seat of the soul. Um, and <clears throat> as far as I understand, actually uh, lies in the you know the 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 dead center of your brain. Um, the pineal gland produces small amounts of DMT during REM sleep. And, you know, again, you know, we, we come back to this dimethyltreptamine. And, you know, for anybody who's never heard of this stuff, I, I really encourage you to go and, you know, uh, pick up the book, uh, The Doors of Perception, uh, or watch the documentary because the book is dry as a popcorn fart. Yeah, the, the, the documentary is actually on Netflix. Um, that's where I saw it. There you go. Um, um, and, and, and really look into this stuff because it seems to be – you know, it's a, it's like a, a spiritual aid, some kind of spiritual lubricant, something that that allows us flesh and blood critters to penetrate to, the other, the other side, to, to slip into the, uh, the, the slip into the the spirit realm. Well, uh, well, I, I, I didn't mean to sexualize it like that. Uh, just more so to, to, to help you know, loosen our bonds to the physical world, as it were. Okay. And allow us to let go. Okay. Well, you know, uh, the thing I was driving at was that, uh, you know, because DMT, of course, is the chemical that scientists 
used to explain like the the crazy near death experiences people have um, when they're you know when they they die for a little bit, or um, you know some people say again like it just helps us get over there, but it, it's an important chemical. It's an important chemical um, to do with near death experiences. And when we look at Gary's story, yeah, it seems pretty abstract, but I would expect that from a chemical that's very, uh, you know, the strongest hallucinogenic that we know of, number one. Number two, um, just the reason why I brought up dreams is that I don't know about everybody else out there, but I've had some really effed up dreams. Um, and I've even had dreams that when I wake up, it again, like I can't articulate it because it, it, it consisted of me, like a, a, a perspective of, of movement and stuff like that, that was almost mathematical. Um, it, it, there is no body. There was no, um, you know, it, it, I can't even put it into words. I, I really can't. But when I was in the dream, it made sense how everything operated and, and how it moved around and how it, um, you know, how it was. I, I remember it was almost like I and, and a bunch of other things were literally like blocks moving around in, in weird patterns. And, um, and that was my state of being. And it made sense in my dream. And it just really didn't make sense when I got up. And I've had numbers of, of really strange dreams like that. So if our brains do release tiny bits of DMT while we're sleeping, well, then that makes sense. And it also stands to reason that uh, Gary's experience here, uh, a, a near-death experience um, due to the, the fever, um, you know, it, it makes sense that, uh, you know, he would have such an abstract, and it, it's not going to be grounded in our reality here. Um, you know, perhaps DMT, like we said before, uh, and, and like other hallucinogens, um, literally take the filters off of us, and, you know, we can see things in, in a different perspective, in a different light that is totally foreign to our waking bodies. Um, so, you know, Gary, when he, he went through this, uh, that's exactly what he saw was really strange, uh, different things. But I mean, it, it, it made sense to him and I can still get some sense out of it as well. Right. One of the one of the themes that pops up a lot in well in Gary's story and <clears throat> is spiritualism and and um, you know DMT and all this together is that of um, geometrical patterns. Um, and some people refer to as sacred geometry. Um, also, you know, a, another another word that pops up. Um, that people, you know, a lot of people don't know, and so they don't tend to use it when it, it describing it. They just use geometrical patterns, um, but fractals, and this this idea of infinitely complex uh, geometrical shapes and patterns that get even more um, complex, and uh, the deeper you go. And, you know, there's some indication that our universe may be comprised of fractals, you know, uh, patterns within patterns within patterns. And, you know, for anybody who studied, you know, look at a, 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 a single atom, you know, with the, with the proton, the neutron, the, the, you have the electrons that are orbiting. And then you look at the sun and its planets and the moons and this, this, you know, this little circ circular dance that happens, you know, as above, so below the old hermetic principle, um, you know, on the bigger scale, um, you know, I think you need a, a very wide, wide lensed perspective um, to kind of take all this in. And I mean, sure, on one hand, you can, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, I think the saying goes and just just toss the whole story out and chalk it up to a, a fever stream. Um, or you can, you know, you can try and take the experience, take the story, um, almost like a, you know, a, 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 a parable of sorts. You know, this is one man's journey um, into perhaps, perhaps this was a journey not of outer space, but of inner space. And perhaps it provides the rest of us a window 
um, of, of a little bit of understanding into maybe you know our, our the search for uh, of inner space could be far more interesting than anything that we could ever find in outer space. Well, that's a good point too, because the other thing I was going to say is that, you know, for us, um, or actually for any near-death experience, it's often uh, said to be, you know, what you experience on that end has to do with your mindset. You know, basically everything you experience and you think and you learn and your perspectives, you take that with you. And I know at least when they're speaking about the void, um, you know, they call it the void because there is nothing else. It's only you and your thoughts and your perspectives and, you know, your thought patterns. So depending on the things that you've experienced in your life and how you think, you know, your time in the void is going to be very different from someone else's. So, you know, in Gary's case, and I'm not saying this is the void, but if if you're literally manifesting some kind of uh you know your afterlife uh you know Gary is going to i mean maybe he you know did looking like he he was studied up on herbalists or he studied up on shamans and that kind of thing and and literally for him uh his afterlife was his you know his experience and knowledge and stuff manifesting itself um now the the other thing to point out of course is that uh, even when he came back he had this newfound ability um to to look into the spirit world by looking through his hands which you know that i, I sh- probably should have asked him if he could still do that <laughs> it's a really good question that i didn't ask him um but cuz cuz he came back and i mean for uh but it puts me in mind of all those alex gray paintings well, it made me think of the lens of truth in Zelda, <laughs> right? <laughs> because you, you use it and you can see things that's there that you can't see, you know. Um, and I, I do believe uh, Alex Gray, that's, uh, I believe. That's the it's tool the, artist. That, that's, yeah. The, uh, or that, that's the individual who has done the artwork for pretty much all, well, almost all of Tool's albums. And is and, he. Uh, I think Lateralis was probably a great example of. Uh, of the layers of, of artwork when he looks at the body and um, more often than not, he'll, he'll, he'll draw the hands with eyes in the palms. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually, th- isn't it? Now I know this is a little out of topic, but isn't cause I know he did all the artwork. I, I think that's why their new album is so late coming out. It's like they're in some kind of a lawsuit thing or something or other. I don't know. I, I could be wrong, but, Damn it! I really wish that album would come out. <laughs> also, I think it's is pertinent to to bring up a uh, um, a former guest of the show. Um, personally, one of my you know favorite guests that we ever had on the show, um, Howard Storm, and um, particularly one statement that he made from his experience that um, you know he said that he was told. He relayed to us that he was told that, you know, our goal ultimately is to um, participate in, in creation, in the act of creation. And, you know, if, if, if we, we can take anything away uh, from Gary's experience was that, you know, by, by the end of it, he certainly did seem to be participating on some level. Um, at least, it, it, perhaps in the spirit realm, a very uh, elementary level, uh, but per- participating in some level of creation nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, because he was manifest or uh, uh, manifesting things, and and uh, yeah, like the Panthers and stuff. Um, I wonder, in in that case, you and I doing the show, does that count? Because we're creating, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're 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 creating. We're, 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 we're we're doing it on a on a on a much lower level, I guess. Much. Um, and and also for any anybody who's familiar with Terence McKenna, um, you know he has a very famous story of um, a a very vivid, very uh, uh, intense DMT experience uh, where he was visited by these little bouncing ball creatures. Uh, who were, you know, f- made of light, multicolored light, uh, that he refers to as the machine elves. 
and that they taught him how to sing uh, living creatures into existence. Oh, yeah, there we go with that. Uh, that is a, a common thing, too, where people say that the universe was sang or, or musically created. And I always find that parallelism interesting because uh, if you look at music, you got all these different frequencies, but that's the same for matter, which is why we have uh, infrared light, you know, uh, cameras that can pick up infrared and ultraviolet. Uh, you know, again, we have these spectrums and they're at different frequencies. Everything is measured in these frequencies. Um, so, and that, not, not to mention, you know, yes, all energy. Everything on the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, is, is separated on the spectrum based upon its its, its vibration, the amplitude uh, of its vibration. Um, but likewise, with the the individual atoms that make up all matter, um, they also all vibrate on specific frequencies. And in fact, there's a there's an overall frequency to all the matter and energy in our universe. That all vibrates at a uh, a similar amp or at the exact same amplitude, um, and you know part of it vibrates at the same amplitude. Which, you know, if basically saying that if anything, if somebody had a, a had a strange crystal and said, "Hey, this came from another dimension," we'd actually be able to prove it because we by looking at the the vibration of the atoms in that particular item, because everything that we've ever studied. Um, does vibrate on a, a, a very specific frequency that is native to this universe, as far as we know. Yeah, so um, you, basically we're in our infancy. I mean, that's why I find it kind of funny sometimes when uh, somebody speaks of a weird paranormal experience or a near-death experience, and it's like, oh, it's bullshit, science hasn't proven it yet, or whatever. It's like, well, yeah, science is still trying to figure it out. It doesn't mean it there's not a thing, right? We, like we, we, we've been practicing science a lot, uh, 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 for a lot less time than, that we, than we've been, you know, practicing, uh, uh, uh different forms of spiritualism. Well, and they, I think a lot of cases, um, or in some cases, science has even just kind of started catching up to spiritualism. And if you read some of the uh, ancient Indian texts, uh, specifically uh, the Bhagavad Gita and the Rig, Rig Veda, um, you know, to me, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy read for sure. And I'm sure there's lots, le uh, there's a lot of, of things that are lost from a, uh, in, in, in translation as it's translated into English. But to me, it read like um, uh, quantum physics being explained by a poet. Uh, that, that's, that's, my, that's my take on it. Well, I just found, you know, here's here's my thought. Uh, some people act like, um, you know, if, if science hasn't proven it, it don't exist. So that's that's like saying before gravity was proven, gravity don't exist, right? Because science hasn't proven it. Well, why didn't we all just float away, right? Science is, is on the path of figuring out this stuff, but, I mean, we're human on this one little planet. We don't know shit. I mean, this place is huge, right? I mean, when you look in terms of the universe and stuff like that we're nowhere yet i mean if, if we're if we're saying that nothing exists except for what uh, humans have figured out in our short time here well then that's just stupid <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it, as as much as and i mean any anybody out out there who's heard me ramble on for hours and hours in these podcasts know that i love science i'm a big science geek um but I very much agree with your position on this. I mean, it's science is definitely still in its infancy. You know, it's it's a it's an amazing, fantastic system that we need to use. I mean, we need to use it. We can't do away with it. Um, I, I think that it, it's something that's going to help quantify these experiences at some point. Is going to help us to understand them um, better. You know, and and I think that at some point in the future, perhaps. Will will even marry um, spirituality, spiritualism, and science together in a in a in amazing new ways and create Scientology. And, uh, I really <laughs> hope not. I really really hope not because uh, if Lord Xanadu uh, is really real, and uh, we all have to 
I, I, there's all kinds of special terminology for we, we shouldn't make fun of Scientologists because next thing they'll be their lawyers will be after us. Yeah. What are your crimes? They'll have us cornered in an alleyway. <laughs> well, here, here's the thing. I, I love science. Um, I, I, hell, I'm all for it. I, I hope that we continue. In fact, I wish we could do more because I, I feel like a lot of times science is held back, uh, especially in realms where things are taboo. I mean, you look at the, the DMT thing. If you watch that documentary, and I only mention this because it's on the topic that we covered. But, I mean, they said, uh, you know, scientists who were in doing this stuff that, uh, you know, it's that whole research is stagnated because at some point, uh, some of these guys, these upper level guys came in and said, you know, um, it's forbidden. You're not allowed to do it anymore. Yeah. And well, basically, once it gets classed as a, you know, this is a class four controlled substance. Now you're forever banned from doing research with it. You exactly. Know? And I mean, it's, like, who knows? Those, go ahead. Who knows what we could have learned over all these years? It, it, scientists are basically told what they're, uh, you know, areas they're allowed and not allowed to work in and even if they have the money and and stuff like that i mean you can be completely discredited i mean hell if you're a conspiracy nut uh i'm sure you've read many many stories where people just disappear because of uh certain things that they've looked into or um you know actually there's something i want to say there but i can't because i might disappear (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but but uh, say it. Nope, nope. I well, I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll tell you later. Um, nobody asked me in the comments. I'm not saying it. But uh, yeah, the whole idea of uh, these certain aspects. I mean, look at Skinwalker Ranch, right? That was the only crazy spot I've ever heard of where the the government actually had people investigating. Um, and as soon as they started getting some interesting stuff, it was like, bang, close it down. Billionaire buys it. Now nobody knows about it. Um, well, I don't think the government was ever officially involved in it. I mean, somebody from the government may have asked um, uh, Bob Bigelow to look into it and report back to him. Um, but, you know, the government stayed far away from that. You know, NIDS, National Institute of Discovery of Science, that, that was 100% a Bob Bigelow created and funded entity and so, so he, he jumped they in. stayed away from that oh uh, I, you know what i'm probably mixing up stories again anyway um you definitely are but that's all right th- that's kind of my thing <laughs> <laughs> i'm abstract <laughs> you're like a picasso you've a picasso mind <laughs> yeah i just mix it all together but there <laughs> there definitely are um I, you know there's a, a a quote from neil armstrong that he gave uh, to a bunch of students, graduating students, and he says, "It is up to you." The the, the uh, now I'm paraphrasing and butchering it terribly. Go and look it up. Um, it's up to you, the the next generation, to peel back truth's protective layers and to achieve the amazing things that human beings are able to achieve. There are so many political and social social and um, um, theological barriers in our way when it comes to, you know, scientific. And, 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 and when I say scientific, I also relate that to spiritual progress. Because I, I, I think the two eventually will become synonymous, that we'll reach a certain level of understanding of our universe and of our place therein that... The, the the two will never be able to be separated. That we'll finally bridge the gap and understand that that the understanding of this universe and the understanding of our, our spiritual selves and our spiritual existence um, is is intrinsic to one another, un- in- inseparable. Um, and yeah, w- wasn't there an alien that w- uh, you know was interviewed or something like that, and they asked him. You know, what was the difference between or something to do with like uh, with science and uh, spirituality? And he said there was no difference or something. Yeah. Like- so you're referring to um, the, the the mystery man. You know, he eventually um, this mystery man who did a couple of interviews 
uh, who talked about this this extraterrestrial entity who was in Area 51 that they've had there for years and years and years, and <clears throat> his body was breaking down. He was dying, and, you know, it was very difficult for them to converse with this entity, even though they could speak with it, it you know, it was very difficult to get answers from it. And one of the few things that we were able to relate to uh, with one another was the idea of, of spirituality. And, you know, they, they asked what's, you know, what's the difference between, you know, science and, 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 you know, spiritualism and science and nature. And, you know, he said there, there is no difference, you know, and, and, of course, all those tales that this guy, uh, spun for us um people are on shore that you know they're they're true or, or what have you but uh, again here you know we just have another uh, another little piece of information in this vast web of information that exists in the world today um and you know like we say so many times um it's really up to you guys to decide what what's what here you know i mean we do the best that we can in presenting things in, in the way that we understand it and in, in the way that we process information. But, you know, um, in this in, in this life's journey of going forth and seeking knowledge and seeking truth, um, it's it's up to all of us. You know, the onus is on all of us to, you know, kind of pitch in on this and, and to throw throw in on the ideas, you know, what's what, what's true, what's false. Um, there's there's too much of both out there in the world today. I think that's uh, I, I think that's the disinfo agent's true weapon. You know, you don't take anything off the internet, right? You don't you don't. Oh you, yeah, you don't once it's there, it, it's there, right? Yeah, you know. Um, uh, I mean, you can try, but all you're going to do is is have more people looking at it because everyone will be like, look, look, they're trying to take it. It got to be true. Yeah. So the the opposite of that is to buffeted on all sides with untruth. Oh, well, it's propaganda. Right. Again. And, and then right? if you if you bury if you bury truth in a sea of lies, then it's going to be much more difficult for um for anybody to make out what's what. Well exactly. Uh, and with that said, um we're gonna clue up uh, Gary's story here. So if you wanted to read that on the official site, uh the story is called Trials of a uh, Trials of the Snake. And uh, if you have an effed up story, I just had a thought, okay? It's pretty spontaneous. Somebody had asked me an email about this, and you just got on the topic of Area 51, and now I'm kind of interested in it. Um, I wouldn't ask this normally, but I, I honestly, I didn't think we were going to get so many submissions on, uh, you know, we asked you guys for stories on near-death experiences. We asked you guys for stories on um, cryptzoology. And damn it, we got it. We got them both. And we, we got all of our uh, near-death experience stories good to go. We got all of our um, cryptozoology ones good to go. And as you know, we're doing a near-death experience week this week. It's thematic the whole week through. Uh, the next week will be cryptozoology. So here's for a new topic. If you guys have this story, because I didn't think anyone was going to have near-death experience stories to share. This might be harder, but if you got it, um, very interested in it. If you have, if you've worked in the military or you worked at a top secret base like Area 51 or, or something at like S4, Dream Lake, Dulce. Yeah, like if you've been in a position where you have seen and heard really bizarre stuff like regarding UFOs or, or cover ups or, or whatever. Send that to us. That would be an interesting thematic week, I think. Um, you can send that. Of course, we'll take any f up story you got. But if we can get enough stories on that, I'd like to do a thematic week on the conspiracies, UFO cover-ups, and top-secret government bases. Um, so if you have that, you can send that to us at uh, our official website. It's F-Dupstories.com. That's E-F-F-E-D-U-P-S-T-O-R-I-E-S.com. Um, we'll get it on the website and we'll get it to a podcast and man, if you guys can get enough of those stories to us, even three or four, um, we'll do a week of it and it should be uh, an interesting change of pace. Uh, so with that said, uh, I hope you enjoyed Gary's story. 
We have at least two more podcasts on near-death experiences coming uh, to clue up the week. And they'll be pretty damn interesting as well. So uh, stick around for that, and we will catch you next time. So long. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much for listening.